The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the first book of Samuel, in the 15th chapter, verses 22 and 23. Verses 22 and 23 in the 15th chapter of the first book of Samuel. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now, we continue a series of considerations of the message of the Old Testament. We are considering the message of the Bible to the modern world and to the modern men. We are all aware of the troubles and the problems of the world. We are all aware of the situation in which we find ourselves this evening. The world is full of trouble, full of perplexities and problems and difficulties. And all thinking, intelligent people are concerned about this and are seeking a way out of this. And they've done so, of course, for years. But the word, I suppose, that more than any other sums up the attitude and the feeling of the modern men is the word frustration. In spite of all efforts, in spite of all endeavors, the problem persists. The situation doesn't improve. Now, the whole tragedy of this situation lies in just this one fact that the world in its perplexity and in its trouble refuses to listen to the one word which at one and the same time can explain its situation to it and has a solution for it. And that word, of course, is the word which is to be found here in the Bible. That is undoubtedly the greatest tragedy of all in the world this evening, that mankind speaking generally refuses even to consider this word. It dismisses it with disdain. It feels that it's almost insulting in 1955 to be asked to listen to the message of that old book, the Bible. The world feels that it's outgrown all this long ago and that this, though it may have spoken in past centuries and to former generations, cannot possibly speak or have anything of value to say to the modern, sophisticated, highly developed men. Now that, I think you'll agree with me, is the common attitude. So we have been trying to show that not only does the Bible speak to modern men, that it is the literal truth to say that nothing else does speak to the modern men. Nothing else, as I say, can really give him a satisfactory explanation of why he is as he is, and why his world is as it is. But the Bible does. And we've been looking at what it tells us. It takes us right back to the very beginning, and gives us an account of creation, and of how the world was ever made, and how men was made, and the conditions as they once were. Then, how have things gone wrong? What's happened? Well, the Bible tells us in the very third chapter of Genesis, men ceased to listen to the word of God. That's the whole cause of the trouble. He set himself up and his own ideas. He turned his back against God. He rebelled against God. And down he went. And his whole world went down with him. And it's been down ever since. And the whole situation would be one of unrelieved gloom and utter despair. Were it not that God has come and has visited men, even in his rebellion and sin, and has spoken to him. And has held out a hope for him and has told him about his own great plan of deliverance and of rescue. He began even that in the Garden of Eden. He came to the men and made his great announcement that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head. Now then, the whole Bible is just a development of that. 
Isn't it a tragic thing that people fail to see this? Of course, it's very often due to the fact that as they read right through the Bible, they become lost in uh, the multitudinous facts that we have, and they fail to see this one line that runs right through. They fail to see the wood, they miss the wood because of the trees. But if you stand back, as it were, and look at the Bible, you'll see this great message running right through it. And we've been picking out some of the supreme examples of this as they are to be found in the Old Testament. God, in his infinite grace and kindness, did not cease to speak to men when men in his unutterable folly rebelled against him and brought ruin upon himself. God continued to speak. Sometimes in action, sometimes in words. We've considered it. We've seen God speaking in the flood when he judged that ancient world and destroyed it, saved a remnant, started a new course. But we saw how that again went astray. That men, and this is the whole history of men, you can summarize human history in just a few phrases. The whole of human history is but a repetition of that which was done by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Here comes the word of God and man refuses it and does something else and brings troubles upon himself. So we considered the story of the Tower of Babel. Saw the same thing again. And then we watched God raising up a man called Abram in order to give us a pattern and an example how life can be lived when a man lives in obedience to God. Abraham, the friend of God. What a wonderful man. The supreme gentleman of all history. A man who stands towering above others because he listened to God. God said to him, come out of your country. And without telling him where he was to go, Abram listened. He obeyed God and went out, not knowing whether he went. Now there is God speaking still. And then we rush on and we remember that we have considered how God uh, turned this one man into a nation of people for himself. And then he spoke to this nation in a very special manner in the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments. God, as it were, said to this people, don't rely upon the fact alone that you're my people. Though you are my people, you've got to live as I tell you. And if you don't live as I tell you, you'll find yourselves in trouble. He gave them the two only alternatives, blessing or cursing. He said, if only you keep my law, blessing I will bless you. If you don't, I will visit you with punishment. And, of course, they said, very well, we'll keep your law. We are capable of it, and we are going to do it. But they failed completely. But again, thank God he didn't give them up. He spoke to them anew and afresh in the giving of a tabernacle with all its wonderful picture that we were considering last Sunday evening of man's relationship to God, of God coming down to dwell with men in the Shekinah glory of the holiest of all and telling and teaching men how to approach him and how to maintain contact and communion with him. All of it adumbrating Christ, prophesying the coming of God's own Son, God speaking to men the message of salvation and of deliverance. There is a great chapter in human history again. But you know, we can't leave it at that. God went on speaking. And the next great section, which you find in the Old Testament, is the section which we describe as the prophets. And that's the subject which we have to consider this evening. You are familiar with your New Testaments, and you notice there the frequent references to the law and the prophets. Our Lord himself refers to the law and the prophets. In the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere, there's con there is constant reference to this in the pages of the New Testament. Indeed, in a sense, you see, from the call of Abraham, you can divide up the history of the Old Testament into the law, the prophets. The law, including, if you like, the tabernacle, which was brought in with its ceremonial in order to cover the sins of those who had broken the law. The law, the prophets. Now, it's important, I say, that we should understand this about the prophets. For about a thousand years, speaking roughly, before the coming of the Son of God into this world, God spoke to the nation of Israel through the prophets. 
And the first of these prophets was Samuel, the man who figures in this chapter that we are looking at tonight. You remember how Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, was preaching his sermon after the day of Pentecost, and he put it like this. He said, he quotes, And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Well, that's a very good summary there in the third chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles of the great prophetic message. Samuel is the first of this mighty series of prophets that God sent with his word to speak to the children of Israel. And therefore we can do nothing better as we want to learn something of how God has spoken to mankind through the prophets than to consider the ministry of this man Samuel and especially as we find it illustrated here in this 15th chapter of this first book of Samuel. Now, the prophets were very special people. They were men who were taken hold of by God and to whom God spoke, to whom God gave a very special message. It's put very perfectly in the 10th verse of this chapter. Saul had been doing the various things which we're going to consider, and then we read, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, and all that Samuel had to do was to go to Saul and deliver this word which God had given him to Saul. That's the typical action of the prophet. The prophet is not just a very wise and very clever and very able human being. He's not just some outstanding philosopher or a man with an unusually deep political insight into contemporary events. He's not merely a seer in that sense. No, no, he's much more than that. The prophet is a man divinely inspired of God. He is a man upon whom the Spirit of the Lord came, a man who receives the burden of the Lord, the message of the Lord. God enlightened his mind, gave him understanding, gave him a message, and sent him to deliver it, and gave him power to deliver it. That's the whole story of these prophets. Samuel was a prophet. Elijah was a prophet, Elisha was a prophet, Isaiah was a prophet, and all the others who've written their books, they're all prophets. And they all belong to a common pattern. Every one of them says the same thing. They've all got the same message. They all aver together that it isn't their thoughts, it isn't their idea. Some of them, like Jeremiah, tell us quite honestly and quite plainly that they'd prefer not to speak. They know that every time they speak they get into trouble because the people didn't like their message. The people wanted their prophets to say peace, peace, when there is no peace. But the prophet was given a stern message, denouncing and exposing sin, calling the people to repentance, and the people hated them for it. Many of them were put to death and massacred. And yet they have to go on speaking. Stop giving me messages, says Jeremiah. But then he finds he can't keep still. The word of the Lord, he tells us, was burning in his very bones. And he couldn't be quiet until he spoke again. And it's true of every one of them. And they've got this great message from God. What is the message? Well, the prophetic message divides itself inevitably and very naturally into two halves. First and foremost, it was, as I've just been saying, a message which exposes the sin of the people. It unmasks their sin. It reveals people to themselves as they are. But thank God it didn't stop at that. It then went on to tell them about God's wonderful and amazing promise. Now, as I say... For nearly a thousand years, God continued to speak to mankind like that. To challenge them, to upbraid them, to get them to face the facts for a long thousand years. But as we shall see, it all ended in failure. Not that God failed, but this was a part of God's purpose to bring home to men his real need. Oh, the patience and the long suffering of God. Now, here I say in this story, this tremendous, dramatic, moving, tragic story of Samuel and Saul, 
We have the whole thing typified and illustrated almost to perfection. You see, the message of the prophets was in a sense just this, to show the depth of sin. To show the essential twist, perversion, that is involved in sin. It happened like this, didn't it? God gave the law. The people said, we will keep it, and then they failed. Then God introduced the whole of the ritual and the ceremonial of the burnt offerings and the peace offerings and the sacrifices in order that men's sins might be covered and atoned for and that they might still maintain their communion with God. It was God who established it. You remember we saw it last week how God took Moses into the mount and gave him all the detailed instructions about the building and every form and type of offering. But you know what happened? The children of Israel began to say to themselves, Ah, oh, this is all right. All we've got to do is to just uh, carry out this ritual and ceremonial and it doesn't matter very much what else we do. It's all right, they said, as long as we say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, all is well. As long as we take our burnt offerings and sacrifices, nothing else matters at all. They reduced this amazing system which God, as we saw, brought in in order that people might have communion with him. They twisted it to such an extent that they used it as the means of avoiding having communion with him. They turned it into something mechanical. And they said, as long as we follow the rules and regulations, go to the temple, take our sacrifices and offerings, the priest receives them and says, all is well, all is well. So God, you see, had to raise up this mighty succession of prophets to say, no, no, it doesn't work like that. So that you will find as you read the message of all these prophets, that in a sense every one of them is just saying what this man Samuel, the first of them, said to Saul. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Now this is a very interesting point. You will find that some of the so-called higher critics have been saying for almost a hundred years that there's a great clash, of course, in the Old Testament as between the priest and the prophet. They say the characteristic of the prophets is that they didn't believe in any burnt offerings and sacrifices at all. They didn't believe in any priesthood or in any priestly service. The prophets, they say, denounce all that invariably and just preach their great ethical message and tell people to obey God and all will be well. But of course, that's entirely wrong. How did they go astray? Well, they've gone astray because they've just missed this. They have failed to observe that what the prophets denounce is not the ceremonial system but the abuse of it. What they denounce is that men and women should say, as long as I take my burnt offering and sacrifice, I'm all right, doesn't matter what I do. That's the thing that's denounced. You mustn't trust in that way to them, they say. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. They don't mean by that that you mustn't do this. What they say is you must do that but do it in the right way. Don't make that a substitute for the other but regard that as a part of your obedience. But there you see that was the very thing that the children of Israel had been doing. And that as we see in this mighty and moving story is the very thing that poor Saul, the first king of Israel, did. I say poor Saul. Because he was a very likable man. He was a wonderful man to look at. And there was a kind of nobility about him. I don't know of any more moving story than the story of the tragedy of Saul, the first king of Israel. And here we find the very essence of the tragedy. It ends, you remember, in the extraordinary story of the witch of Endor. I don't know how anybody can read that story without weeping. As you see this man that had so much nobility in his soul, down and out, lying on the ground. But I say we mustn't be moved and controlled only by our sense of tragedy. Tragedy. 
The story is here undoubtedly in order that we may learn the great principles that God would inculcate through it. We are all in the position of Saul. He's but a representative man. What happened to him is what's true of all of us, and therefore we must see ourselves in terms of this man. What is the essence of this message? You remember the story how Saul received commandment from the Lord to destroy the whole of the Amalekites, to leave nothing at all. Every single thing was to be destroyed completely because of the way in which the Amalekites had treated the children of Israel in their terrible need. And Saul took his army, and you remember what happened? He kept King Agag alive, the king of the Amalekites, and he kept the best and the choicest of the flocks and of the sheep and so on. And his idea was that he'd keep them in order that he'd have a great a ceremony, a great sacrifice of these, the choicest of the flocks and the herds which he would offer to the Lord. He keeps the king and the choice of the animals. And it was for doing that that Samuel was sent by God to pronounce this terrible judgment upon the head of this unfortunate and wretched king. What's the matter? What's the lesson? What's the message? What is God saying to us through Samuel, through Saul? Well, let me try and extract the principles and put them in this form. The prophetic message, I say, is always divided into two sections. First, the exposure of sin. Second, the hope of the gospel. Let's start with the first, the exposure of sin. And the exposure of sin is general in this way. That what the prophets always expose is the subtlety of sin. And the element of self-deception that comes into sin. And of course it's all here to perfection. In the case of this man Saul, the first king of Israel. The tragedy of Saul, of course, is the tragedy of a man who deceives himself. He's, it's the tragedy of a man who really does persuade himself that he's doing something rather wonderful. And doesn't realize what he actually is and what he's actually doing. Saul was very pleased with himself when Samuel came. You remember that when he saw Samuel uh, coming down the road to meet him, uh, Saul uh, rose uh, to meet him. And he came to him and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Isn't it tragic? Can't you see the scene? The man of God, Samuel, who'd been sent by God originally to pick out this man and to tell him that God had called him to be a king and had anointed him. They were great friends. They liked one another. Samuel loved Saul and Saul loved Samuel. And here Saul sees Samuel coming down the road and he runs on and says, Blessed art thou of the Lord. I've done what God has told me to do. He doesn't seem to have suspected for a second or for a moment what Samuel was about to say, nor what was about to happen to him. He seems quite unconscious of it. Why? Well, because he is absolutely self-deceived. He's deceived himself. The thing is so subtle. Well, in what way does the subtlety come in? Well, in this way, doesn't it? The poor soul thought that he really was... Uh, doing something very much better than what he'd been told to do. He was improving on it. It seemed such a monstrous thing to kill the best of the, of the sheep and the cattle, as he says, uh, that which was vile and the refuse and so on was completely and entirely destroyed. But uh, look at these wonderful cattle. Look at the sheep. They're almost perfection. They've been well fed. They've been uh, cared for. You can't surely just destroy them. The thing to do with them is to take them and go up to Gilgal. And there we'll offer them to the Lord. We'll have a great ceremony, a great occasion. It'll be marvelous. And after all, it's one thing to destroy the common people, but a king. No, no, we've got to do something special about him. He may have to be put to death in some great ceremonial manner. He'll have to be held up before all the people. You can't just kill him like you kill an ordinary person. Now Saul had worked out all this, and 
He was very pleased with his idea. He was very pleased with the thought that had come into his mind, and he'd put it to the people, and they agreed. And thus they thought, really, they'd done something rather amazing. Oh, the subtlety of sin. You see, Saul thought he was pleasing. God thought, Saul's whole idea was to worship God. He isn't the man who's turning his back upon God. He isn't the man who's giving up religion. No, no, he's a man who's doing it, well, in the best form that he can think of. He even seems to be doing it in a better way than the way that had been indicated to him. And he's perfectly persuaded and satisfied in his mind that God is going to be delighted with him and is going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If ever there was a man who hadn't a fraction of a suspicion that there was anything wrong with himself, it was Saul. As he went running down the road to meet the old men who'd anointed him as king of Israel. I mustn't keep you, but that's the whole of the prophetic message. Do you remember how Hosea puts it? Ephraim has gray hairs upon him and he doesn't know it. He is like a cake unturned, half baked, and doesn't know it. Because one side's baked, he think all, thinks all is well. Isn't this a great message in the Old Testament? Do you remember it in the case of that remarkable man, one of the judges called Samson? That mighty man to whose power, physical power, there seemed literally no limit and no end. But you remember he got involved in sin, and the devil used Delilah in order to betray his secret from him. And while he was in a deep sleep, they cut his locks, his hair, wherein lay the secret of his strength. And then she produced the trap and awakened him and said, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. And he rose up and shook himself as before. He'd done it many times, you remember, when they'd laid traps for him. He'd got up and he'd shaken off his enemies and destroyed them all. But this time, he wist not that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. And that's the tragedy of men in sin. The only one he rarely deceives is himself. Sin is self-deception. Jeremiah has underlined it once and forever in his great phrase. The human heart, he says, is desperately wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? It's deceitful above all things. Here is a man who thinks he's out to please God and finds that he isn't. The other general element which I must notice is this. To use the technical term, man's amazing ability in the matter of rationalizing his sins. Rationalizing, you know, means explaining them away to ourselves. Look here, said Saul to Samuel, uh, Samuel to Saul, what have you been doing? Well, says uh, Saul, he's got a perfectly good explanation. That seemed all wrong to me. Surely this must be better. That's called rationalizing your sins. And the prophets are experts at exposing that. Read your Old Testaments, my friends. Read the lives of individual men. Read the life of the whole nation of Israel. And you'll find that at every point they can justify all they're doing. It seems so marvelous to them. They can always put up a good case. And of course we're all experts at it, are we not? We see somebody else doing the same thing and we denounce it. But somehow or other, when we do it, it isn't quite the same, is it? That other man does that thing. There's no excuse for him. Oh, yes, but when I do the same thing, well, of course, there were circumstances. I wasn't the only one to be blamed. There was terrible provocation, and this other person, and so on, rationalizing your sin. I can't remember whether I've ever told you what I regard as the best story of all to illustrate this process of rationalizing. It's a story that was told against himself by the saintly Charles Simeon of Cambridge. That saintly man whom God used so signally amongst the students of Cambridge 150 years ago and a little after that. 
Charles Simeon was determined that it was a good thing for his soul that he should get up early in the morning in order to read his Bible and to pray to God. But he was one of those men who by nature did not like getting up early in the morning. And he had a terrible struggle over it. And he found that in spite of all his resolutions, he simply could not bring himself to get up in the morning to read and pray and meditate and spend time with God. Then he thought that he'd punish himself in this way and so solve his problem. There was a woman whose business it was to come to his room to light his fire and to knock at his door to tell him it was time for him to get up. And he told her to come at a given hour in the morning and to call him and that if he failed to get up at that particular hour he'd give her a golden half sovereign every time he failed to get up. And he thought this was going to be excellent. Because now if he didn't get up, he'd have to give her half a sovereign. And half a sovereign meant more then than it does now. But this is what Charles Simeon found himself doing. The woman would knock at the door and say, it's five o'clock, sir. And Charles Simeon found himself beginning to say this to himself. Well, now, this woman is a very poor woman. She's in very poor sack. Well, all right. I think you are right in laughing, but let me remind you that you're laughing at yourself. That's precisely what we all do. That's rationalizing your sin. That's finding a perfect explanation for what you do and what you don't do. That's the thing that Samuel, that this man Saul was so expert at. The subtlety of it all, the rationalizing, the devilry of it all, the explanations we can give. And, of course, it works itself out in practice in the way in which we are told here so perfectly in the story. What we do, you see, is we substitute our ideas for God's ideas. Saul's argument was that to keep the best and to offer it to the Lord was the right thing to do. We've all done it in our turn. What God wanted, of course, was obedience. God told him what to do. He substituted for that something else which appealed to him. And it seemed so much better. Sacrifice. And mankind continues to do this. God has told us very plainly in the Ten Commandments and in the Sermon on the Mount what he wants us to be like and what he wants us to do. And what do we do? Do we carry it out? No, no. We do what we want to do and then we say, we'll put it right by doing good. I'll have my way and then I'll give a sop to God. I'll give a donation. I'll give my time to something else. I'll give some marvelous gift. Isn't that it? We'll go out of our way and do something marvelous, something wonderful. And we say, God will be delighted with it. Now I've really done something big there, something really great. Oh, again, let me give you just one illustration of it. It's, I think, absolutely perfect in a New Testament incident. It's the incident about another king whose name happened to be Herod. And you remember we are told about this king, Herod, that he took his brother Philip's wife. He looked at this woman and he rather liked her. Didn't matter to him that she happened to be the wife of his own brother. He wanted her, so he took her. And John the Baptist was sent by God to denounce him, to show him and tell him plainly what he'd done, and John did it. And because of that, Herod put John in prison. And yet he couldn't leave him alone. We are told in the record that Herod went very frequently and listened to John speaking to him there in his prison cell. We are told that Herod feared John, knowing that he was a man of God, and delighted in listening to him, and did many things. And yet you remember the end of the story was that it was at the command of Herod that John the Baptist was beheaded. This is the point I'm emphasizing. 
Herod feared John and cared for him, told the warders and the jailers to be kind to him. He knew he was a man of God, and he knew he was a marvelous preacher, and he liked him, and he respected him. Indeed, we are told more. He did many things, many of the things that John said to him. He did many things, but they were of no value to him. Why? Because he didn't give up Herodias. He did everything but the one thing that John the Baptist told him to do, which was to give up his brother's wife and cease to live in sin and cease to live in adultery. He did many things. Doubled his subscription to a good institution. Cared for the prisoner. Was kind to other people. Oh yes, he'd do anything but not the one thing. And it availed him nothing. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You can't put 11 months and more of wrongdoing and of sin right by giving some great donation at Christmas time. That's the argument of man in his sin, isn't it, and in his subtlety. And he thinks it works with God. The other thing, of course, is that man has his own categories of sin. Do you notice how this man, this prophet, Saul, Samuel, puts it to Saul? He says, listen to this, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. What's he mean? He means this. Saul knew perfectly well that witchcraft was a sin, and he, wouldn't have been, he would never have dreamt of indulging in witchcraft. In the same way, exactly, he knew that certain things were iniquitous, and he'd never dream of being an idolater. He was a godly man and a God-fearing man. He'd never stoop to idolatry. He has his own divisions and categories of sin. He says, there are certain things I don't do. Yes, do you see, but they were not God's categories. And God therefore sent Samuel to tell him, look here, Rebellion is as bad as witchcraft. And stubbornness is as bad as iniquity and idolatry. And Saul has a mighty progeny in this world. Drunkenness, they say. Abominable, horrible. Adultery. Murder, these horrible things. These terrible sins. There are respectable people who denounce them as Saul denounced witchcraft and idolatry. And it's never dawned upon them that they are sinners or that they're in any way sinful. We draw up our lists of sins in such a careful and in such a subtle manner that we are excluded. What we do is all right, but the other thing is all wrong and terribly sinful. Such is the subtlety and the perversion of sin, but let me hurry on. You see, what happens is that Saul really ignores and rejects God's standard and puts his own in its place. And therefore the simple message of the prophet to him is just to tell him this. that what matters is our relationship to God and that it is a personal relationship. You don't deal with God on a commercial basis or on a legal basis, it's a relationship of persons. God wants our heart. God wants our devotion. God doesn't want things that I can empty out of my pockets. He wants me. He doesn't even want my activity. Take how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 13. Though I have the tongue of men and of angels and can speak with an eloquence and an oratory, even surpassing Demosthenes, and have not charity or love, I am sounding brass or like a tinkling cymbal. And though I may have all knowledge and all mysteries and have all prophecy without love, without charity, it's of no value at all. And though I give my body to be burned and have no charity, it'll avail me nothing. There are men who've even sacrificed their lives, but it's of no value unless their hearts are right with God. 
I remember a person once coming to me and asking for spiritual advice. She said she was in great trouble in her soul and without my saying a word she said, look here, I tell you now, I'm prepared to do anything. If God wants me to go to the heart of Africa, I'm ready to get up and go. I said, what if God's message to you is just to do nothing and to stay where you are? And she didn't like it. It's sometimes easier to be heroic and to go to Central Africa than to stay at home and do some humdrum, unspectacular job for God. Don't misunderstand me. Don't go out saying, I don't believe in missionary activity. Of course I do. What I'm saying is this. If God wants you at home and you go to Africa, it's as bad as the reverse. It's as bad as staying at home when God wants you in Africa. It's what God wants that matters, not what appeals to us. And the great message of Samuel to Saul as the great message of all the prophets to Israel was, is just this. That what God wants, I say, is our heart, our entire obedience. Not a partial obedience. Not for us to pick and choose. Not for us to worship him in our way and to do what we think is so much better. No heroics, no elaborate ceremony and ritual, no man-made system, but the simplicity of this gospel. God and I. And my opening of my mind and my heart and my whole being to him. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind and all thy strength. He wants the center of my life and whatever else I give him, if I don't give him myself, the throne of my being, he won't like it. He'll be against me. Well, that's the last thing I want to mention. The final thing that Saul forgot, you remember, was this. Was that God, after all, is the judge. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, in spite of keeping the best of the cattle and the sheep as an offering, he'd rejected the word of the Lord. Because thou hast done that, he hath also rejected thee from being king. God is no respecter of persons. The fact that he was the king of Israel didn't save poor Saul. And it'll never save anybody. God is over all, is the Lord of the universe. And he knows all about us and everything we do. We, you see, with Saul tend to say, I have carried out the commandment of the Lord. Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. We're all ready to say that. Look what I've done. As Christ says, the people will come and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name done many wonderful works. Lord, blessed art thou. And then the terrible pause. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then meaneth the bleating of the sheep in mine ears and this lying of the oxen which I hear? If you've done the commandment of the Lord, what are we hearing? You haven't done it. As the Lord himself will turn to such people at the end and say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Say what you like, my friend, do what you like. We are all in the hands of God, who is the Lord of the universe, the maker of heavens and the earth and all that is therein. And we've all got to stand before him. As Saul had to stand before Samuel and hear the verdict. The great, the last assize is inevitable and unavoidable. We must all appear before the judgment throne of Christ. 
and judge be judged of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. It is appointed unto all men once to die, and after death, the judgment. And he knows all about us. Be no use pointing to your sacrifices and offerings, and all the marvelous things you've done. What then, will be the question put to you, what then, what then meaneth this, that, the bleating of the sheep and the lowing of the cattle? What is this then? And there'll be no answer. There is no answer to God. His word is simple. His word is plain. Son, he says, give me thine heart. You may have nothing in your pockets. It won't worry God. It's you he wants. It's your heart he wants. It's your love. It's your devotion. And you can make your systems of religion or of anything else. And it won't satisfy him. He can't be bought. He can't be purchased. He's told you what he wants. And he'll be content with nothing less. And man in sin is so twisted and perverted that he doesn't believe that. And he believes he can manipulate God. And he is doomed as long as he thinks so. But, and this is the amazing thing, though we are such hopeless, wretched, foolish, benighted, deluded creatures, God, in spite of it all, is sorry for us and has mercy upon us. He knows that what we all need is a new nature, nothing less. We are all like Saul, the twist is in us. And the prophetic message for a thousand years, these mighty men of God and their preaching, they fail to convince even the nation of Israel, and man is still unconvinced tonight. And he'll remain unconvinced until he has a new nature. And he can't produce that for himself. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Can a man give himself a new nature and get rid of the twist? Of course he can't. But what is impossible with men is possible with God. And God has sent his only son into this world. And he's taken human nature unto himself in order to perfect it. And he gives us his own nature, a new mind and a new heart, a heart to love God and to serve him willingly. That's the whole message of Christmas. It's the message of salvation. That into the shambles and the failure and the wretchedness of man in sin, God sent and has sent his own son to rescue us and to redeem us. It's the only hope for the world tonight. It is the only hope for every one of us as individuals tonight. If you've seen yourself in the picture of King Saul, go to God at once and confess it and acknowledge it and tell him all about it and cast yourself at his feet and upon his mercy. And he will assure you that he will receive you, that in Christ he pardons you and delivers you, and will make you his own child, and eventually have you to be with him in glory throughout eternity. Oh, may God grant that we should all learn the great message of the prophets to all of us as we see ourselves in Saul. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips.
You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.